And so I thought what would be really fun for you to, do, to share with us is because I, you did such a, from the time that I met you seven years ago, is it seven years mm-hmm. ago, six years ago, you have pivoted like nobody. And <laughs> the lessons that you did, I mean, it might have been easier for you to do it than it is for a baby boomer. But the journey you went through and the decision making process you went through and the, uh, and the, the just the, the milestones along the way and, and how you were able to visualize. I'd love you to share that with me. We've never really yeah. talked about that. We've never really talked about it. Totally. But I think that the lessons for me and for my community would be awesome because you've done, unlike many of our friends, you've done it successfully. <laughs> and I always, I, I'm, I always have the impression that you did it with, that you were intentional all the way along the way. Is that, is that fair? Or is that, is yes, that, is that, is, is that urban that, myth? It, saying intentional is like the nice way of saying I'm a perfectionist. Okay. That's what it feels like to me. Yes. I think everything I do is super intentional, but to a point I get so intentional that it's perfectionism. So there's a balance there. So let's take you, let's go to the Wayback machine. We met, is it seven years ago? Mm-hmm. Six, seven years ago. I think so. At yeah. Social Media Marketing World. And we were both in the same space at the time. You were doing YouTube videos and they were pretty much how-to videos on a lot of tech stuff. And mm-hmm. you used to do them with a little camera standing up in your closet. You make sure you had the high angle so your face looked good. It and looked like a closet. It was just like my bookshelf in the corner of the room. I didn't have a lot of space I was proud of. So I really kept it cropped in, you know? I always thought you were in a closet. <laughs> <laughs> but you did. I had a window. What do you mean? I had to use daylight. Yeah, well, that was behind you. I didn't see it. Yeah. Um, so, so you, so you were doing how-to videos, and you were growing a presence on YouTube. You had, uh, uh, you had th- your one overwhelming asset was you were comfortable on camera. I think it was that fair to say. I think so. I I had a couple of years on YouTube before I started that channel of tutorials. So I I had started to get to know what it was like to have a conversation with a camera. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it's not something I was naturally good at. I was, if you ask my mom, she was like, what is happening? Like I was hiding from the camera as a kid. It was never supernatural to me. I wasn't a performer. It comes off that way because I was natural, but it was I was natural after a period of a couple of years. I had like a smaller channel that was more personal experimenting, editing, and just having fun um, that helped me get acquainted with how to talk to a camera like it was a person, basically. So we were on parallel paths, as far as I could tell. You were, gonna, sure. you were, you were teaching a different, a different demographic, but you were mm-hmm. teaching them how to use technology, how to edit video, how to create a YouTube channel, how to be personal productivity was a big part of what you talked about, yep. technology, all of the same things. So we became friends immediately because we were right in the same space and our channels were of a comparable size. Totally. But then something happened. Yeah. I kept barreling down the same path, but you took a right turn. Tell yeah. me about the right turn. Um, I think basically what happened was, uh, I, I, you know... I was the video girl who talked about video on video like for a while. And it started out social media and technology. Then it was really got focused on video because as the landscape of marketing changed, people started to become more open to other mediums. So then I that's where the video, video, video thing was happening. When I started to write my book in 2016, and that was to come out at the beginning of 2017, I started to think like, you know, this would be a great way to cap off what I've done and move into into the next stage of the relationship with my audience. So essentially, the, I, once I get something in my head like that, it's just like, it's a matter of when. So I write the book in 2016, launch the book in 2017, spend the better half of, tw- better, better entirety of 2017 promoting that book, talking continually about what I did. And then at the beginning of 2018, I completely changed. And I, the reason was partially, you know, I wanted to explore new territory. I wanted to be able, be able to go deeper with my audience. Um, but also just like, you know, I got to keep making things interesting too. YouTube continues to change. Audiences continue to change. And you have to you have to keep things interesting for other people, not just yourself. And I think that's really what I was doing. I was just ready to try something else. Yeah, but trying something else gets, it means that you get into teaching podcasting or something. What you, you, went, yeah. you went from being a person that teaches about technology and talks about the world and, and practical skills. Yeah. To being a motivational leader. Uh, for the audience, Amy's community 
follows her for lifestyle advice and to, I mean, one of your catchphrases is to, is to live the life that you want. Am I mm-hmm. paraphrasing it? or To go after the life you want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so you've become a leader to your to your community, which is primarily uh, primarily women in their 30s. Am I mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you, you, you've become a real leader to that community. And that that is more than I'm going to take on this new That's marketplace. Fair. Because Absolutely. you became the product instead of showing Adobe. Yes, for sure. For sure. I mean, I, I still think I was kind of the product during the marketing phase because I was really trying to sell my business at the time. So you really had to trust me. But to be fair, you're absolutely right. When I say I wanted to try something new, it wasn't like some new shining, shiny object that I thought was interesting. It was when you start to pay attention to the audience and you start to, which is a fabulous luxury. A lot of people who are probably listening to this are like, great. Like I have nobody really leaving me comments or telling me what to do. But with that luxury, I just simply was listening to the comments by seeing that there was a predominant following of women that I cared about helping who may or may not have actually started making video, but they were learning a lot from me. So they would watch my content anyway. And their questions were always the same. It was, how do you get motivated? How do you get confident? How do you make the time to do all that? How do you teach yourself? How do you bootstrap? It's not necessarily, I'm going to go try the the shiny object thing. It was, I still want to help these people, but now we need to go to another level. That's Mm. honestly where that motivation came from, because I'm just looking at what are these things they're commenting to me? What are their holdups? What are their barriers to entry? Now let's address that because I've made everything I'm ever going to want to make about how to use video. You can find that anytime you want from here on out. Let's explore new territory so you could potentially do that if you wanted to. Okay. So you then took that right turn or left turn. I don't know which direction. What direction did you see in your mind? What direction did you see? Uh, I think it w- It felt like a left. Okay, a little bit like a left. We'll make a left turn. So you okay. took a left, and and you and you started to plunge into. It. Now, was it a gradual change no. in content, or was it? There, like, were, there were a couple stop? of things. There was a couple of things that really made me feel excited to just do it all at one time. I had just gotten married, also at the end of 2017. Um, my my maiden name is Schmittauer, so. A long for a long time, it was Amy Schmidt Tower, Savvy Sexy Social. Like that was my shtick. That was what I was doing. Um, but as I became a public speaker and an author, my last name was a little bit difficult to work with. And my married name was not too bad from a branding standpoint. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to change my last name. I also need to drop Savvy Sexy Social. I don't need this shtick anymore. People know who I am, so I can lean into that. And I also want to change content. So when I was looking at all of these things, it didn't make sense to go like one little prick at at a time. It was like, let's just rip the bandaid off. It's like, this is a, this is what's happening. If you don't like it, then I'll take it into consideration. But I always say if, P. Diddy was able to change his name, then I can do it too. And if Netflix was able to survive the branding disaster that they were making when they were trying to change their names and separate things out, then I can survive it too. So I just ripped the Band-Aid off and everybody was like, all right, cool. <laughs> it <laughs> everybody, <worked>. shook their, <laughs> everybody shook their heads a lot. But but there's a lesson in this. You know, there's a lesson in it. And a lot of us who uh, have built our career look in the past and look at what look at our body of work as our calling card. And I think that you looked at your skill set as your calling card. You looked at your message. And so rather than looking at your resume, you looked at what you could give. And if you are at the place that so many of our my colleagues are, where they're having to reinvent themselves from a regular office job to something new, they rely on their resume. They were, so it is important to us. I'm not diminishing that value. The work you did before was valuable, mm-hmm. but there's the reason that they could turn left or you could turn left is because you didn't rely on that anymore, but you relied on what you had going forward. You had, you relied on your skill set. Is that fair? Yeah, I, th- I, yes, I think it is. I, I don't, I never really thought of it that way, but I also think that sometimes I'm like, no, I, I think my resume does come in handy every once in a while, but I do think you need to just be open. The reality is that the way that things are changing now it if you if you're too worried about all the things you've accomplished to the point where you don't even realize nobody else is paying attention to that anymore or times have changed so much that they're irrelevant that 
you have to be able to pull from different areas and feel like you've invested space and time and energy and improving different areas of your life so that it's not just I'm banking on everything that's happened in this resume. I see some of the most successful people in the in the world that have worked for huge companies, especially in the marketing sector, and because of whatever they were holding onto on their resume, they can't get a gig now. And they've done some incredible work. They've maybe moved the digital age even more forward from a branding standpoint, but whatever their thing was that they were so hooked on being their their hook that they told the whole world about, it just didn't catch on because it's not what we're talking about. And so that you lose ground. It's it's especially hard if you've been doing something for so long for so many years and it just feels like a slap in the face that everything you've done is no longer respected, is potentially being paid for uh, much less with somebody else or it's being automated by a, a tool. Um, that can be really difficult to grapple with, which is why I think – You've got to look at what have you learned or what have you executed on throughout your career that's never going to go away. And a lot of us have learned some level of people skills that are not going to go away. Just because we have tools that help us with that, it doesn't mean that the understanding how to how to be human on a basic level is going to go away. It, it's, it's more valuable now than ever before. I keep trying to get my head into what your headspace was like as you went through these changes mm -hmm. and, and just how you envisioned, how you, how you, like when, when I envision a, a new product within my, within my product mix, it's a very small thing to imagine. My imagination has to be quite limited to, to change your name, to change yeah. the complete direction of your channel. Did mm -hmm. you did you use a tool? Did you sit down and write it out? I mean, what was your what was your daydream time and your imagination time to get this new model in your in in, in, in you know to get it to a point that you could start moving in that direction? I don't. I I really think I. It's just a lot of thoughtfulness. Once for me, I don't get too in my head of whether something's going to work or not. I just want to make sure that I one hundred percent believe the words coming out of my mouth when I say them. So. It was probably the last quarter of 2017 where I was saying, you know, oh, the, the other thing I changed was my YouTube URL, too. That was yeah. a whole thing. The YouTube URL, the name of the channel. I'm changing my last name as an author. Like, my the name on my book doesn't match my actual it, – it's just – there were a lot of things, but it was like – if I, if I write it all down, it seems right to me. It's 100% the truth. And it's quite frankly, in the long term, going to make my life easier. Um, Amy TV goes over a lot better now than Savvy Sexy Social. A lot of people got the wrong idea about that name because I was trying to be funny and cute. And it didn't mean anything inappropriate. But algorithms think it does. And people think it does. And so that judgment was there. So I knew that was going to be the right call. I also knew it was going to be the right call to change my last name to Landino, both for love and marriage, but also for the sake of somebody being able to pronounce my name when I walk on stage to speak. I mean, it's just a silly problem to have if you can't get the guy who's so excited you're there to speak at his event to say your name right. Like, I just was trying but to make things easier. you also leverage that. I think we, we have to be fair that while you were Schmittauer, you coined the Schmittastic yeah. uh, hashtag yeah. or, the, or, the, or the screen my name. My handle. And uh, your handle. And that worked really well for you. You managed to make that work really well. Yeah, that was, Yeah. Because it's like, I believed in it. Like, yeah. I, I just think that's, that's where the core of everything is. I believe that every change I made was the right decision based on the many experiences that I had. And um, nothing was, I'm, I'm a little, we've talked about this, like I'm fairly intentional. I don't just make a decision and do it immediately. I work on it immediately to see if it's got legs. But I didn't just go on Twitter one day and go, I changed my name. Like, it wasn't flippant. It was, welcome to 2018. This is what we talk about now. This is what my channel name is. Oh, and I changed my last name because I got married. You all know I got married, so this should be no shock. And it was just, I'm having a human conversation with people who have been my friend online for four to seven years, depending on how long they've been around. So it just felt like, hey, this is a life event happening with somebody that you know. So let's just have a real conversation about it. Did you turn to anybody else for advice on it? Um, I talked, uh, I actually talked to YouTube specifically because I wanted to make sure that on the logistics side of changing channel details, that there wouldn't be any issue there. Um, and I wanted to make sure that the URL was working at the same time as the announcement. But other than that, I talked to my husband and I said, here, like, let's get very real about my last name. 
my last name Schmittauer was not the last name I was born with, but I have never been married before. This was a name I chose. It was my stepdad's. He adopted me when I was 12. 12 is the age in the U.S. where you, or at least in the state of Ohio, where you have to tell the judge yourself, I approve of this man being my father. So that name meant a lot to me. So the conversation I had with my husband was, I love you. I'm very happy to be at Landino, but at the same time, like I'm taking your last name because it's logistically easier for us as a family going forward and for my brand. The, the, <laughs> my, my maiden name is the one that clo that's closest to my heart, not just for obvious reasons, but because it was a very intentional decision that I made in my life. So, so that was a conversation I had to have. And I was very frank with him because I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say like, oh my God, I can't wait to give, take someone else's last name. Personally, I think it's great when women keep their maiden name. I would have, if it made sense for me, but, uh, it just didn't. Mm -hmm. So that was a conversation I had, but everything else, um, when I see the vision for how everything's going to work and how much easier it's going to be to communicate it. And that really is what it is. Don't make it hard for people to talk about you. Um, I just knew it was the right decision. So you see people facing the need to pivot every day. I'm sure you see it through a different lens than the rest of us. Sure. When you look at your ability to take what you did and convert it and change direction successfully, what do you see in yourself? Like if you, in the quiet of the night, what do you say? I'm lucky that I am wired this way because I, they aren't doing it and I was able to do it. What are, what, what, what are the secrets? I, the first thing that pops into my head is that instead of feeling restricted to what the world knew about me, I felt there was possibility for what they could know about me. That was a big part of it. With the, the number of people who came up to me after and said, you had so much equity in these names and in these words and in this genre and in all of these things, you had so much equity in that and you totally threw it to the wind to try something else, which of course they don't say it until they're like, and you were successful, you know, like <laughs> nobody says it initially. They're like, we'll see how this goes. But, but when they, when I started hearing that more often, I realized how a lot of people see the world in more of a scarcity mindset. I see a lot of things in scarcity. I see a lot of things in, Ooh, could that really happen? But this was something that I felt really lucky that I looked at it as more of an opportunity than something scary. Um, I, I was, it, it, it's not like there weren't moments where I was questioning it, but that's why I gave myself plenty of time to let it set in and make sure I set all my ducks up in a row before I just unleashed it onto the world. I was ready. I would prepared the branding accordingly. I just knew that it was the right decision. And when it was finally ready, I did. Do you think that you, uh, that you were drawn in that direction more because of the opportunity or the scarcity that you saw or more because of what you felt you had to give? Like, <clears throat> was it, what, did you feel that there was a vacuum that you were starting to fill or were you going to insert yourself in a marketplace and create your opportunity that way? I just, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to answer the question other than to say, like, I think that there's, there's always people in your space who are going to be doing the same thing as you. There's always going to be other people. I, I don't look at it that way. I just thought this is how I want to do it. This is where I'm going to put myself and try to do my best at it. And we'll see if my audience likes it. I, it was just, I knew I had more to give and I wanted to be able to build the platform to be able to do that. So I just, yeah, I, I, I respect that there's people that have paved the way in every aspect of the business that I've been in, in different genres of content and different, um, actual expertises. But, um, I just knew that I could offer a different perspective for a specific group of people. Okay. So the same person's creating how to content in a valuable space, which is, it can be a very successful marketplace. Mm -hmm. And now th three years later, she is creating content in the personal affirmation space. Is that mm -hmm. a good way to put it? Personal, sure. personal yeah, development. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of efficiency of, of life and mindset, yeah. uh, confidence and productivity. Mindset, good, good point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why are you exploding in popularity here? And you had reasonable, but pedestrian growth in the other, if we are completely honest. Totally. I mean, this is what blows my mind is that so many people were like, look at how much you had going on. I was a peon on the scale of YouTube, whatever's like, mm -hmm. it doesn't even matter. And so I, um, 
I don't know the answer to that question. I think a lot of weird things happened at one time. I made a pivot. A couple months later, there was a lot of drama on YouTube um, with some of the viral yeah. vlogs. And YouTube needed to answer for... They needed safe harbor. Yeah. yeah. We, we were together to at Social Media Marketing World just as right? that was popping, right? We remember exactly. we were talking about that. And, the, and um, I don't know when this started happening for me. I think it was February or it was late January, February when things started taking off. Just to set the stage from a numerical standpoint, it was like end of 2017, I had 80,000 YouTube subscribers. By uh, mm -hmm. beginning of February, I think I had, had 100,000. So 20,000 subscribers in one month, which was not normal whatsoever. Um, and then I had another 100,000 in less than 100 days. So what and that was in March. We were together then. Do you remember sitting down and we, we, we sat down and you said, Steve, my channel's going crazy and I don't know why. I know, yes, because you just don't, because the analytics just say, oh, this is coming from the YouTube homepage. Like, what does that even mean? Like, it's, it's not a real traffic source because it's customized on your experience as a whole, not on a per session basis. So that's why I said that. And yeah, I was, it was in March. I don't think I'd hit a hundred yet in March, but, but you were getting 8,000, 9,000 a month. All of a sudden you were it growing was, by that. Yeah. yeah. There was a month I hit, I had 30,000 subscribers yeah. a month. It was insane. But there was one thing that happened <clears> and I still kind of look at it and I go, that's suspicious. When YouTube was having to answer for a lot of algorithm issues, when so and so was in a bad spot because he did something naughty, and so he should have been taken it off. It was right the after the suicide page. video. It was yep, right after the suicide, suicide video. Uh, forest, and it, the suicide forest. And so YouTube was under a lot of pressure. Casey <clears throat> Neistat interviewed this, the chief business officer, I believe, mm -hmm. and they talked through. We made some mistakes. Da 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 da. And Casey asked, you know, what are you looking for? And they said, we want to see more female creators. And I kid you not. It was moments like mm -hmm. I felt like moments either before or after that. It felt like after I don't remember anymore, but it was very, very close to that occasion. That things started to change for my channel. Now, I don't know if that is just ironic, but obviously the content had changed in my favor for that to happen. The, the real issue with YouTube is that business to business doesn't work mainstream. They can only make so much money on that. That's been my experience. So I believe that with my how-to space being very B2B, it was siloed on the scale of B2B channel growth. And that's really how I feel about it. When I changed it from a B2B mindset, talking to the same person in a more overall, how can you go after the life that you want? That's when everything changed. And I do believe that that means it means there's more mass appeal. They found more ways to plant me in front of people to see if I would perform well. And when I did, we both reaped the benefits. So that's what, that's a little bit of a weird way of explaining what happened, but I think that's what happened. I don't know. So you used to teach a lot of people to get started on YouTube, uh, how to get started, how to establish your channel and how to build a channel. Uh, has, has the roadmap changed at all in the past couple of years? Um, it's changed in a lot of little ways, but when it comes to like the, the core, I don't think so. I think most people don't realize that consistency is key. It's just this thing we all keep saying, but consistency means a lot of things. It's showing up on a regular basis so that one person and then two people and then four people and then eight, eight people will show up when you show up to make content. But if you keep saying you're going to show up and you don't because you're like, eh, no one's watching anyway, it, you just can't go anywhere from there. So there's some of those basic values that actually uh, completely change everything. As a matter of fact, I think I post too much on YouTube and I'm thinking about the summer I'm going down to one video a week. There's something about you're the at, algorithm you're at that two right now. I'm at two right now. I, I was at one per week for most of 2018. I started to add mm -hmm. some flavor and things have changed again on the channel. So I'm just trying new mm -hmm. things because the reality is I want to show up as much as I tell my audience I'm going to show up. But if the platform is just stunting growth because of the way that they would prefer things to go. I have to see that and respect it and then say, fine, I'll just put this content someplace else if YouTube only wants me to post once a week. So I'm trying that out this summer. We'll see how it goes. Um, but it was very successful for me last year. And the reality is they told me this when I went to YouTube Next Up Camp a couple years ago. 
also 2016, right before this, that could have been a big part of the pivot was the beginning stages of that. They, um, they said, why are you making so much content? I was posting three days a week at the time. They were like, why are you making so much? You should be spending the same time and resources in one video per week because the average per success, well, what industry standard on YouTube is one video per week is basically what they said. Post one video per week, one really good video per week. We would prefer you do that. Then you post a lot and because you have the ability to do more with one piece. And so that really shocked me. I didn't expect mm. them to say that. I thought that I was the only person in that camp that had a consistent schedule for three years. I didn't miss a Tuesday, Wednesday or th Thursday episode except for one family emergency. So it, it just felt really weird for them to be telling me that, but they know how the platform works. So you just kind of have to understand that you are in these rented spaces for a reason. They have the community there they can send to you, but you got to listen to what they say when they're like, you're posting too much. And I think the whole like daily vlogging thing really made everybody think that that's how you get more watch time and it's not. But now I'm going into like, the weeds on YouTube. So yeah. <laughs> I'm fascinated. I'm sure everybody's enjoyed it. Yeah. I, <laughs> Here's one thing that I hear over and over again, a theme that's run through from the first question to now is you have a great capacity to deal with change. Which is shocking to me because I'm such a control freak in a lot of ways. I think I've learned in my, in the last like five to 10 years, like how to control my controllingness. Um, but yeah, every time something's that's presented. That's very to meta. Me, that's a very meta I statement. know, I know. It's super <laughs> weird. I feel like when you explain something to me and I get it, I really don't question it. I really just want to say, oh, that's the way it is. Great. I'll do it. Like, I have no reason to question something until it shows me something different. And so, yeah, I think when change is presented to me and I see the positive side of it, I'm 100% all in. I'm going to go in prepared, but I'm I'm all in because until I, I'm proven otherwise or somebody is proven otherwise, I really want to try to do the best I can. So I, I think that's why. I think it's not, oh, crap, change is happening. It's like, oh, this is more effective. And you're going to win me with that every time. Mm. So you're, you have a, you have a partner in a podcast. Brian Fanzo is a, is, is, is a good friend of yours. He's a good friend of mine as well. I had him on early. He was one of my, he was the first millennial. You're the second millennial oh, on the wow. show. He was the yeah. first millennial guest. And you have a podcast that you do with Brian, uh, which, uh, which we'll link to. It's a great podcast. I listen to it all the time when I'm walking Farley. It's like we're hanging out together. It's just like you two are sitting on the couch with me, which is exactly what you want. Aw, that's awesome. But I gave Brian an opportunity to hang himself, and I'm going to give you the same opportunity to cause okay. yourself irreparable damage with all of the baby boomers in the audience. And that is, I asked him why it was that there are not more successful baby boomers in social, specifically YouTube in your case, but, they are, we, but for the most part, it's uh, successful baby boomers in online and social are like unicorns. You hear about us, but you don't actually ever see one. Mm -hmm. So why do you think that is? Um, I think the internet so wildly messed people up who are older than millennial. Like, I don't even think that just about baby boomers. I know a lot of Gen Xers who were like, what? Like, what is this thing that we have to do? And so, and when a lot of people who are, have no, they know what they do, they do it really well, they keep doing it. And in the meantime, they don't take their blinders off to see social and internet completely changing the way their work works. That will, that's going to stunt you. And I think it stunted a lot of people, specifically baby boomers, because once you get to a certain point in your career, you're just super disinterested of all this other stuff. So I, I don't, I think that's part of it. I don't think that's all of it. I also think that, um, there is, there is something, I think this whole like uh, willingness to change and willingness to try new things and, oh my gosh, new technology here, new technology there, new, te there's efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. It's not changed to me. It's just getting better. So I think that makes somebody more open to, oh, I can talk to people all over the world on the internet. And so that, that is what it feels like to me. My initial gut reaction when I think of a baby boomer, boomer resisting YouTube or resisting trying is that they mostly resist that this even happened at all. And, and unfortunately, I'm going to sound like a total jerk millennial on the show. Like when you approach things with a victim mentality that this happened to you, there's nowhere to go from there but down. 
Like mm-hmm. it's not good. It's not good. And and so it sucks, but it's really fun in my opinion whenever I see a baby boomer or whenever I see even somebody just a little bit older than me that didn't quite get it right away but now they're like they get it and they're into it and they're asking questions that gets me so excited because I know how much their mindset had to change to get in that place and to to be open. And I almost now, somebody said to me the other day, my mom was a tech teacher before there were mostly computers in schools. Okay. Yeah. My, so my mom is technology savvy to say the least. She doesn't always know everything, but she, she knows a lot. And somebody said to me the other day, they were looking at her Instagram stories because she's very into Instagram stories when she's got my dog. And so she's, she's using it. And somebody said, I'm so impressed by your mom's techiness. And I was like, are you kidding me? My mom's the reason that there were Mac computers at that elementary school. Like it, it's, it, it's kind of weird. Cause like, we're not doing you any favors. Cause we just assume you guys aren't into it. And then when somebody is, it's like, wow, like somebody knows how to use an iPhone. And I just think that we're all so far beyond that. And you, if you're open to seeing the next chapter for yourself, it means just being a little bit more open about the many, 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 sometimes paralyzing opportunities that are in front of you technology wise and how it can make things better faster, but also it doesn't actually change how you need to be as a human. That's what I think. I think you skated around the thin ice quite nicely there. Thank you. So, uh, so where do you turn? We'll wrap things up with a couple of simple questions. Where do you turn for resources? Where, who do you learn from? What resources inspire you and spark new ideas in Amy Landino's brain? Uh, I'm very lucky. I get to read my comments. I get inspired all the time, but I, I also think you just have to look at where the attention is and see why the attention is there. And so, uh, to me, I think Instagram indicates a lot. I think Instagram teaches us what people are thinking about because people who, if you're paying attention there and the creators who are creating there, they're making something that a YouTube creator could do, but on such a short snippet of a level, it's like, Oh, that's interesting. Like how could I do something similar to that, but make it better because I have the resources of a longer video and more equipment and more opportunity. People usually hear the video when they first start watching instead of listening to it on mute and Instagram. Mm -hmm. So I like to just look at where are people paying attention and how can I do my own little version of that someplace else? Um, I think Facebook is still obviously extremely relevant, but we do see generations start to jump around on the different platforms and say, well, now that, now that mom's over here, I'm going to hop over here. Like, Mm -hmm. well, mom, like you should be paying attention over there because your demo is going to move there just as fast. And it's also not because the cool kids only hang out in these places. It's because the technology is so good that it's worth being immersed in that environment. So I just, I genuinely just get inspired by taking a look around. Um, I, I don't actually consume as much content as I used to. I used to watch so many YouTube channels. I I loved absorbing who was around me, but I don't, I'm so efficient and I block out my time so much that it's like, I, I have to really stay in my own lane. So I'm not replicating somebody else, but I'm truly being as creative as I'm, uh, as possible for me. So I like to observe what's going on, what are the trends, what are things people are talking about, but I'm not watching so much YouTube content that I feel like I'm not creating enough. And also sometimes when you watch too much of what you wish you were doing, you paralyze yourself into not doing it at all. So yeah. that's that's a that's something that I realized I was like, I'm watching way too much YouTube. I should be creating because when you do that, you just start to sound like other people. And I don't want that. I don't want my audience to think I'm changing into somebody else. Yeah. What do you, so what, what I, and I, this might be a bit of a leading question because I think I know the direction you're going to go with the answer, but what are mm-hmm. you really excited about? What, what captures your curiosity now for the next, for the next phase? And what are you excited about? Well, I'm starting to write my book, which is really exciting because the first book was so hard to sit down and start doing um, because I'm just not a natural writer, but I had everything in my head. This one's exciting to me because that pivot that we just talked about, it surrounded a lot around how morning routines are different for everybody, but if if done the way to your liking can really set you up for success long term because you're living your life on your terms to start every single day. So, so, that's, so the new book is about starting out your day in the right way? In your own way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what does that mean for you? And and because 
I don't like how specifically my generation, I don't know how about you guys, but you we guys. wake up, we wake up and not me, but we wake up and we roll over and we hit the snooze, but we still get on our phone the second we wake up. And it's like, you don't get out of bed. You stare at Instagram. You look at everybody's highlight reel. You're looking at what the rest of the world is doing. You haven't even gotten up to decide how your life is going to go that day. You're letting everybody else tell you how to feel. I'm trying to stop that. So I don't care if you if you wake up at 5 a.m. like me and go to the spin gym and do all that, I don't care what you do. I just want to know that it's on your terms because I believe that every successful person we've ever heard of is doing that, whether they have their phone in their hand or not. But I know for a fact I haven't read a single book or seen an interview where somebody rolls over and looks at their Instagram first thing every single morning. I just know that that is not the key to success. So that's what I'm excited about. I started, um, a little group on Patreon called Shine Squad, and those troopers are helping me a lot. I wanted them to have the inside scoop on me writing the book because their opinion on how that book goes ah. and making it the best possible version is really important to me. And then I add some other fun stuff in there, but that that was a big driver for the group. I like that. That's and I and I know that I've that I've followed you on the Patreon on the Patreon. You're journey. like my I'm Patreon patron. coach. You I, are the guy. I, I, I'm so on another level because of all your tips. Oh, it's it, but I love you know what you're doing really well, and we haven't talked about it since you launched. Is yeah. I hadn't realized how tight it was going to be tied to the book content, and I love that idea. And it, and getting buy in from the community who you who you're writing for that's a stroke of genius, Amy. And Thank get you. and getting them to pay for the privilege to help you. That is I mean, even I'm like, oh, like it's it's just so cool. I think that the the biggest thing is like. That's what's been the hardest part of my job, not pivoting, not doing all these weird things is being okay with the fact that people are so appreciative of the work that I've done that they're willing to pay for more. And that's something so foreign you, to me. Did you, you know? post, did you post, did I see, was it, was it your Instagram post this morning is dealing with their imposter syndrome? Was yeah. It, you posted yeah, on that new, this morning, didn't you? Yeah. That was a new podcast that came out today. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll have to have, listen to it, but that's where that comes from. That's that's yep. part and parcel of it, which we... It is. Yeah, and, and I hope that that's not an issue for my tribe, for the community, for the baby boomers. I hope that we have gotten beyond the point that we might feel like we're imposters in the online space, but we certainly shouldn't feel like imposters in life. And uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that that's not an issue, but I realize that I'm probably, that's faint hope. It's probably... It, well, it, yeah, it, everybody, everybody has their own version of imposter syndrome. It pops up whenever and they're like, ooh, am I going to get found out? I have those moments all the time. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's debilitating. It's just, if you just keep working hard enough, you're like, mm, no, I think I'm owning it now. <laughs> like, okay. Well, one person who I know is not an imposter, and that is the lovely and talented Ms. Amy Landino. Thanks so much for sharing with us today, Amy. Thank you, Steve. I was so happy to be here. That was awesome. Yay! Good. That was so good. I am stopping the